Hi, my name is Manish Gupta and in this video I'm going to talk about instruct blip, which is basically a variant of the blip model. Remember blip uh, uh, and blip 2 is what I talked about in the previous few videos. Uh, blip stands for bootstrapping language image pre-training and uh, specifically instruct blip is basically uh, vision language models with instruction tuning. So it sort of builds up on top of blip 2, right? So it builds up on top of blip 2. OK, so what can instruct blip do? Well, let's look at a few examples to sort of uh, have a little fun and understand uh, the importance of the instruct blip model. OK, so look at this image, right? It looks like something has gone really wrong there. Uh, and the question uh, that one can ask a bot given the image is that uh, what could have happened based on the current scene? Now the bot really comes up with this descriptive answer. So it essentially says that uh, some hurricane or some se severe weather event might have happened and there is a debris covered area. The guy seems to be sort of doing inspection of the damage. And since there are palm trees, you know, since there are palm trees, this must be some tropical or subtropical region. Okay. So some of it does nice complex visual scene understanding and reasoning on top of what it sees in the image. OK. Now consider another example. Introduce me this painting in detail. Now, uh, yeah, of course, it basically identifies that the painting is the famous painting girl with the pearl earring, and then it also comes up with the history that uh, it's a work by uh, this painter and was created at that time. It is famous because of the intricate details and girl's facial expression and so on. OK. So knowledge grounded image description, right? That's that. Uh, you know, also look at this example. What does what makes this dog special, right? So essentially, uh, it's sort of a futuristic uh, dog with some futuristic armor and a glow and glowing green eyes, fantasy, sci-fi, and uh, you know, sort of detailed description of what you see in the image, focusing on the minor details as well, right? And therefore, coming up with a very contextually sensitive, correct answer. Um, on the next slide, I'll also talk about how this model can do multi-turn visual conversation really well, right? But before uh, and and you know these are these are sort of uh, examples of that. Uh, so let's look at this one. So it seems like a very interesting image, right? So can you describe this image in detail? So you know uh, the model first says that it's an open doorway. The guy is wearing a jacket and appears to be thinking as to what could it be, you know, trying to think about the adventure and so on. If he just jumps off and so on, right? So person is uh, looking at uh, the center of the image where a bright star is shining brightly and so on. So what if the so the, then the user can ask what if they jump over the doorway? Right? And then I, I mean, of course, the model says the obvious that there is a vastness of space. So this is uh, probably a good adventure, but then it could be dangerous and potentially life threatening as well. Right? So that's about an imaginary kind of a situation, but you think about a more realistic situation and conversations in the face of realistic situations. Can you tell me about this image? Well, it contains several ingredients, so it names all those ingredients like peanuts, you know, like like carrots, cucumbers, tomatoes, nuts, peanuts, cashews, sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds, and so on. Okay. Now, then it basically says, can you give an example? So the user says, can you give me an example of a healthy meal or snack that you can make, right? So essentially it says, well, you could basically do, uh, you know, several things and then you can make a salad um, and uh, it can be topped with these things and so on. And it says, sounds good. Uh, or the user says, sounds good. Show me the steps of making the salad. So here is a full nice step-by-step -step recipe, right? So it's a pretty good conversation in the context of an image, right? So that's what basically Instruct Blip can do. So now that we understand instruct blip, let's basically check out how is instruct blip fine-tuned, right? As I mentioned, it's basically fine-tuned over blip two. So just to recall, blip two architecture basically consists of two stages of pre-training, where the first stage essentially, um, you know, involves coming up with vision language representations, and the second stage essentially is about uh, uh, trying to come up with a uh, trying to trying to sort of train the LLM decoder for generative task, right? So here what is shown is that, uh, or rather here what is different is that uh, like blip2, you actually have Qformer, which is pre-trained in two stages. And of course, the blip2 also introduced this Qformer guy, which basically contains uh, uh, two transformers, one for image processing Im or other image transformer, the other is text transformer, right? So and it is basically pre-trained as part of the first stage of pre-training itself, right? So here you also have the same Qformer guy, which basically uh, starts the or other, um, you know, the, the it, it uh, passes input uh, to the query transformer uh, to the to the to the image transformer. The inputs are image features which are randomly initialized and trained uh, while uh, while you do pre-training. Okay. 
So it also has these 32 query vectors, right? Each of size 768, if I remember correctly, right? And you basically give those uh, as, as input to QFormer. But then on the other hand, unlike blip2, you also give the instruction, uh, the task instruction as input, okay? So therefore you have an instruction aware QFormer that takes in the instruction text tokens as additional input. Of course, it's instruction fine tuning, so you'll have some tasks and you'll have instructions or prompts for doing those tasks and so on. So those go as input to QFormer. And uh, in this particular case, when you're doing instruction fine tuning, instruction fine tuning is obviously done uh, on top of the pre trained blip2 model. So you have the two stages of blip2 pre training, which have been done. On top of that, you do instruction fine tuning. And when you do that, uh, in the queue format, the self attention layers of the queries and the self attention layers of the instructions both talk to each other bidirectionally. So basically, therefore, the representation, the query features that you learn from the queue format. Uh, have also done enough attention on top of the instruction token. So it basically learns about the visual queries through cr cross attention, uh, but uh, also in a way which is sensitive to the task instruction, to the particular task at hand. Okay. So in some ways, instruction fine-tuned instruct blip model basically learns query representations, uh, uh, you know, multimodal representations, which are uh, very, which, which, which uh, know how to look at an image from a particular task's perspective. Okay. So that's that. And uh, again, you know, as usual, while doing all this instruction, instruction fine tuning and treating and so on, your image encoder and the LLM, which are a part of this entire uh, uh, blip2 and the instruct blip2 model, uh, instruct blip model are, are both kept frozen, right? So in image encoder and LLM are frozen. Okay. Okay. So now instruction fine tuning, of course, needs to be done on some instruction based tasks and prompts around them and so on. So basically in, you know, in instruct blip, basically uh, they've experimented with 11 different task categories as you see them here. So that's basically 11 different task categories and they actually contain 26 different data sets or you can call them as 26 different tasks. Okay. So for example, there are tasks around image captioning, visual reasoning, visual question conversation, QA, visual question answering, uh, uh, image question generation, image question answering, image classification, image question answering uh, with reading comprehension, and then also Lava Instruct 150K tasks, okay? these data sets. Okay? Now, the yellow ones that you see here are basically held in. There are 13 of these yellow ones that are, they are held in data sets, basically meaning they are actually used for instruction fine tuning, while the white ones that you see are in, held out data sets, meaning, they're actually used for, uh, for, for just evaluation. They're not used as part of instruction fine tuning. Now that's important. Uh, also, it's important to notice that in some cases, the white ones uh, are mixed with yellow ones for the same cluster, right? So essentially, for example, there could be held out tasks which uh, uh, or held out data sets which, uh, for which you know, at least some other data set in the task was used for fine tuning. While in some cases like visual reasoning or video question answering or visual conversation QA, you know, the model has not been instruction fine tuned for the entire task itself, right? So basically uh, not just that the data set was unseen, but also the entire task of visual reasoning or visual conversation QA or video question answering were unseen. Even image classification on the hateful memes data set, it's not instruction fine tuned, but just evaluated, okay? So that's that. Now, when you have uh, lots of tasks, how do you basically gather data across all of them? Well, the first thing is to come up with prompts, right? Because each of these, those tasks, of course, they are data sets, but you also need to come up with human uh, looking, you know, uh, prompts that look like, uh, you know, instructions that you can give to a human to do the task, right? So therefore, uh, they design those uh, uh, instructions, those prompts uh, appropriately, uh, except for this Lava one instruct uh, 150k kind of things, because Lava instruct 150k data set already comes with those uh, human instruction kind of prompts. Okay. Now the thing that you have to take care of while you are basically doing instruction pre uh, fine tuning is what proportion of examples should you use from each of those tasks. So this, the, you know, if you have like the 13 data sets on which you are doing instruction fine tuning, let their sizes be S1 to S13. So they choose a particular data set in this. Uh, the probability of choosing an example from a data set is basically given by that ratio. So they choose a particular data set more frequently. Um, you know, if you have more examples uh, in that data set overall, but then it's not linear, right? So basically they ensure that they do square root so as to make sure that the larger data sets do not uh, overshadow completely the smaller ones, okay? Now, how does InstructClip perform? So they do several kinds of evaluations. So I'll talk about these three evaluations one by one. So the first step is very simple, zero shot evaluation. You know, you have done instruction fine tuning and then there are remaining the 13 tasks on which you have to basically evaluate how good the model is working. Okay, so you basically do zero shot evaluation. Of course, zero shot doesn't mean that you have not done instruction fine tuning. Of course, you've done instruction fine tuning, but you have not instruction fine tuned on these 13 data sets. Okay, so. Then they compare with Flamingo models, Blip2 models, and Instruct Blip models. 
Now for each of those models, they also compare with different sizes, like Flamingo is 3 billion, 9 billion, 80 billion parameters, right? Instruct Blip, basically they experiment with Flan T5 and Vicuna as the two LLMs. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, again, they have different size also. So they experiment with Vicuna 7 billion or 13 billion, Flan T5 they experiment with excellent XXL versions, okay? So what do you observe? You observe that uh, uh, first of all, instruct blip models perform better than blip models, uh, and uh, blip models in general perform better than Flamingo models, except for the Flamingo 80 billion model, which is really good. Okay. So thus, instruct blip basically, uh, you know, sort of establishes a new state of the art. You know, these are the best accuracies that one can obtain in a zero-shot fashion, uh, given any other, given any of these models. Okay. Now, what's more interesting is if you really look at the smallest instruct blip model, the Flan T5 XL, uh, which, which has like 4 billion parameters, it's actually better compared to the Flamingo 80 billion model uh, on all the tasks where the results are available across the two data sets, uh, across the two models, across the two models, right? So, so essentially, all of these tasks that you notice, you know, uh, um, um, 4 billion sized, uh, you know, 4 billion sized model is actually uh, 4 billion sized instruct blip model is better than the 80 billion size planning model. I mean, it's of course known that instruction based uh, fine tuning typically gives you really good results, even with smaller sizes, uh, especially in uh, in the in the 1 billion plus range. But uh, it's good to see that it holds even in multimodal vision language kind of tasks. Okay. Now, instruct blip uh, essentially uh, keeps the LLM frozen and also the image encoder frozen. So this basically means that the uh, while fine tuning, you have just 188 million number of trainable parameters that need to be fine tuned, which is actually much smaller compared to many other models where you have uh, more parameters to be fine tuned. Okay. Uh, now, when you do fine tuning on those particular tasks, uh, you know, for which you are also evaluating, like for example, science question answering, OCR, VQA, OKVQA, OK, or A, OKVQA, okay, right? You, obtain, you, you observe that uh, uh, instruct blip basically gives you better results compared to blip2 model, right? Compared to blip2 model, both when you do flan T5 versus Vicuna, okay? So across all of these data sets, across all of these data sets. So uh, in, in some ways, uh, uh, is, uh, you know, uh, the, the uh, instruct blip model establishes a new fine tuning state of the art on science QA, OCR, VQA, and, and A, OK, VQA data sets. Now, even on the other data set, uh, if, if, you know, if you look at OKVQA data set, uh, it's not the best. So instructively basically gives you 62.1, but uh, it is only worse compared to let's say PAMI model, which is basically way larger, 562 billion parameter large. Okay, so that's not too bad is the overall idea. It's in fact the best in that, in that uh, size range. Okay. Uh, now one can say that uh, in instruction fine tuning, you're sort of making the model uh, learn about 13 different tasks. Right? So how about making the model learn about those 13 different tasks without any instruction prompts? Will it really give you the same kind of results? So that's the question. So, so uh, basically here you see two kinds of things, held out average and held in average. So these are averages for held out tasks or held in tasks. So average is over 13 tasks here and 13 tasks on the right side as well, right? What you see here is instruct blips average accuracy across those 13 tasks. And then you also see blip 2's zero shot accuracy, meaning, you know, uh, blip 2 zero shot means it has not been fine tuned uh, or, or trained on any of these tasks, right? Now, what you also see here uh, are multitask results. Multitask meaning you don't do instruction fine tuning, you basically just fine tune using data across all those 13 tasks. Maybe that also gives you better results, right? But what you observe is that that does not really lead to better results, neither for you know held in tasks nor for held out tasks. Of course, for held in tasks, it gives you results which are uh, pretty good, but for held out tasks, it does just does not generalize. Okay. So for multitask, what do we specifically mean? What are these three things, right? So essentially, in this particular experiment, they train with plain input and evaluate via instructions. So the idea is that uh, there are certain different data sets. You basically use each of them to do fine tuning. But then you just give the input as it is. So for image captioning, you're just going to give the image, no other instruction at all. Or similarly, question answering, just give the question and the image, no other instruction at all, and so on, right? So plain input, and you evaluate using instruction prompt, okay? Uh, the other way you could do this is give the data set name uh, uh, and uh, just evaluate using instruction prompt or give the data set name and evaluate using data set name itself, right? So essentially you could say that, hey, um, you know, uh, so so uh, the, the input is visual uh, question answering and then MSD, MSD QA and then you give the question and then the image, right? So that's basically input with the data set name kind of a format, right? And then you evaluate using instructions or evaluate using data set name. 
And everywhere you observe that instruct blip really gives you better results. So, so the instruction prompt, the entire description, a human description of the task really helps. Right? Really helps. Lastly, um, uh, if they compare their results qualitatively, uh, they have not shown any quantitative comparisons with the GPT-4 or Lava. But when they compared qualitatively with GPT-4, Lava, Mini GPT, they observe that instruct blips outputs generally contain more proper visual details and exhibit logically coherence reasoning steps. So logically they observed over a few examples that the reasoning steps are good and they actually give uh, proper visual uh, details as against uh, other multimodal models like GPT-4, Lava or Mini GPT-4. Okay. So in summary, in this video, I talked about InstructBlip, which is basically instruction tuning framework for vision language models. It builds up on Blip2. Um, then, uh, you know, I also showed examples which uh, showcase the capabilities of the InstructBlip model in terms of instruction following around complex visual reasoning, knowledge grounded image description, and multi ton conversation tasks. If you want to play around with the model or look at uh, some of the code, uh, go ahead, look at that URL. Hope you liked the video. Thank you for watching. Connect with me on my LinkedIn or look at my research on my homepage.